Thank you, uh, Aubrey. Uh, thank you very much, very, very much uh, to be with us uh, at such an uh, early hour in, in California. And, My pleasure. <laughs> uh, so we are starting uh, just now. I uh, don't say, say anything more, and uh, uh, you, you have the word. Uh, I, I'm just waiting for your sign up to, to take me, uh, tell me when you want to, to change the the slides, okay? Yes, that is fine. Okay, thank you very much. And first of all, I would like to thank you all for coming back from lunch to hear what I have to say. I must apologize that I could not be today in France. I must be in California. And I also apologize that I cannot give this lecture in French. My French is not quite good enough for that. But I will try to speak slowly so that you can understand everything I say. Um, so you can see my title here. I am interested in developing medicine against aging that works really well so as to stop people from getting sick when they get old. And as you have just heard, the result of doing so will be to extend people's lives. But I think that it is always important from the beginning of any conversation about this technology, important to remember that the main purpose is to stop people from getting sick, to keep people healthy. Next slide, please. So, Sense Foundation is the organization that I work for, that I am the Chief Science Officer of. Sense Foundation is a charity. We are based in the USA, in California, but we have a subsidiary in Europe. So, it is possible to donate money to Sense Foundation and have tax benefits even if you are an EU citizen. Our focus, our purpose, is to develop regenerative medicine against aging. And I'm going to tell you exactly what that means in the next few slides. But first, I will tell you a little bit about how bad a problem aging is. Next slide, please. And these numbers are quite surprising, even to those of us in the medical community and those of us in the transhumanist community. So I think it is useful to remind ourselves <coughs> of these numbers. Many people sometimes think that dying from aging means dying having avoided all of the major diseases of old age, like cancer or Alzheimer's disease. But that's not true, because those, those diseases happen to old people only because they are aspects of the later stages of a process that goes on throughout life. And that process is aging, of course. So anything that mainly kills older people is death from aging. And that means that two-thirds of all the deaths that happen every day worldwide are caused by aging. That's a hundred thousand people every day. In the USA, or in France, or in anywhere in the industrialized world, something like 90% of all deaths are because of aging. So it is quite definitely humanity's worst problem, worst medical problem certainly, and I would say worst problem. Okay, on the next slide, we are going to look at some definitions. I am going to tell you what regenerative medicine is, and also what aging is. Next slide, please. Regenerative medicine is normally considered to comprise stem cell therapy, and tissue engineering, and not much else. But actually, it is wider than that. Regenerative medicine is any medicine which restores the structure of an organ or any tissue to something like how it was before it suffered damage. 
Now, there are many different types of damage that can happen. And most regenerative medicine today is used against acute damage, like spinal cord injury, for example. But it can also be used against chronic, steadily accumulating damage, which is, of course, what we see in aging. So regenerative medicine is actually quite broad. In particular, it also includes molecular regenerative medicine, in which we are not replacing a whole organ, and we are not even just injecting cells, like stem cells, into the body. But instead, we are repairing the molecular structure of the cells that are already there, or in some cases, the material between the cells. And I will talk about that later on. Next slide, please. Now, what is aging? You probably all think that you know what aging is, but there are many definitions of aging that are not very good, or at least not very useful. It's important when we define aging to do it in a way that helps us to organize our thoughts about how we could actually intervene against aging. And this definition does that. In this definition, I'm saying, first of all, that metabolism causes pathology. So metabolism is the word that biologists use to encompass all of the things that the body does. All of the molecular and cellular and systemic processes that go on all the time and keep us alive. Pathology is the word that I'm going to use to denote all of the aspects of ill health that happen in old age. So, what I'm saying when I say metabolism causes pathology is that aging is a side effect of being alive in the first place. And, well, you knew that. But the other thing that I'm saying in this definition is perhaps not quite so obvious. I am introducing this word damage. And I want to use this word damage in this very specific way. Damage is the set of intermediates between metabolism and pathology. It's the set of side effects of metabolism that are created throughout life, even starting before we are born. But these side effects are initially harmless. They just accumulate gradually throughout life and eventually when there is too much of them, we see the pathologies of old age. So that's what damage is, the set of intermediates. On the next slide, we can see... Next slide, please. Um, we can see why this definition is useful. At the bottom is what I just said on the previous slide. Metabolism causes damage, damage causes pathology. But this allows us to distinguish the two main themes, the two main ways of thinking that have existed for how to intervene, how to postpone the pathology of old age. First, there is the geriatrics approach. And this approach really describes absolutely everything that exists in medicine for old people today. The geriatric approach says, Let's take old people in whom the pathologies of old age are already beginning to emerge and let us try to slow down the rate at which those pathologies progress. So let us slow down the rate at which damage can, uh, translates into pathology. So that's obviously one approach that could be useful. If we could do it, we would postpone the age at which these pathologies become life-threatening. The second approach, the gerontology approach, has not yet succeeded in producing any real medicine, but maybe it will do so soon. The gerontology approach says, well, maybe prevention is better than cure, and we would do better if we tried to slow down the process by which metabolism creates damage in the first place throughout life. Of course, if we could do it, that would have the same effect. It would delay the age at which damage reaches 
a level of abundance that causes the pathologies of old age. Okay, so let's look at those two approaches in more detail. Next slide, please. This is the problem with the geriatric approach. Aging is extremely complicated. Lots and lots of things go wrong all at the same time, and they interact with each other. They exacerbate each other. So, in order to actually implement the geriatrics approach well, we just have too much to fix. Really the problem is that the geriatric approach really is intervening too late in the chain of events. The damage that is accumulating throughout life and eventually causes these pathologies, that damage is still accumulating after the pathologies have begun. So the geriatrician's job is getting harder and harder with every year that the patient gets older. It's really just a losing battle. So the geriatric approach is better than nothing, but it is not much better than nothing. And really, it never can be much better than nothing. Next slide, please. On this slide, we can see the problem with the gerontology approach. Metabolism is also really, really complicated. This is a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how metabolism works. And as you can see, it's very complicated indeed. But actually, that's not the worst of it. The worst thing is that this is only what we know about how metabolism works. And every biologist is very aware that the amount that we don't know is much bigger. So really, we are just too ignorant to be able to implement the gerontology approach at this point. In principle, it is more promising, more powerful than the geriatrics approach, but not yet. So, what's the solution? Well, in order to introduce the solution, I am going to make an analogy. Next slide, please. So, on this side, we have a car. This car is more than 50 years old. And most cars don't last that long. Most cars only last maybe 15 years before they just accumulate too much damage and you throw them away and get a new one. The reason this car lasted a long time is because it was built that way, with very tough tires and tough metal and everything. So that's the same sort of reason why the human body already naturally lasts so much longer than the body of a dog or a mouse, for example. But the important thing of the, about this slide is not actually the picture. The important thing is the title. I, I have put VW Bug up there for a reason. I could have put uh, Citroën de, de Cheveux because there are just as many Citroëns driving around that are 50 years old driving around the streets of Paris as there are 50 year old Land Rovers. And the reason that there are so many of those and so many VW Bugs that are 50 years old is because they have being well maintained. Next slide, please. This car was built in the same year as the car on the previous slide. And it's still doing really well, just as well as when it was built. But that's not because it was built to last. It's because it has been very comprehensively maintained. So this shows us that maintenance works. If you can periodically repair the accumulating damage to a machine, then you can stop it from becoming old and stopping working. Next slide, please. On this slide, we see what that means in respect of aging. The damage of old age can be prevented from reaching the level of abundance that we see in the pathology of old age if we periodically repair it. So the maintenance approach does not try to slow down either the process by which metabolism creates damage or the process by which damage creates pathology. Instead, the maintenance approach separates those two processes from each other by cleaning up the, some of the damage every so often 
so that it cannot become abundant enough to cause pathology. And I am very much more hopeful about this approach. On the ne next slide, please. This is just one reason why the maintenance approach is very promising. It seems to target the weak link in aging. It seems to be able to avoid the complexity of metabolism and the complexity of pathology. But on the next slide, next slide, uh, we see that there is a second reason why the maintenance approach is so promising. It turns out that damage is much simpler than either metabolism or pathology. Next slide, please. I believe that all of the phenomena that qualify as damage, by this definition that I am using today, these intermediates between metabolism and pathology, all of them can be classified into one or more of these seven categories. And as you can see, these categories are real biological things. So far, you have probably noticed that I have been talking very theoretically. But here is the real biology. I have used quite informal language to describe this damage here. But as you can see, these are real things. For example, junk inside cells means simply molecular byproducts of normal metabolic processes that the cell creates, but then the cell does not have any machinery to destroy or to discard. So that material simply accumulates inside the cell. The same thing can happen outside the cell, in the spaces between cells. Having too few cells is what happens when cells die and they are not automatically replaced by the cell division, by division of other cells, and so on. So I believe that these seven categories can give, tell us everything that we need to fix, every type of damage that is an intermediate between metabolism and pathology. We can reach that conclusion in two ways. First of all, we can look at what the body is made of, and we can say, well, what are the long-lived structures in the body? The things that hang around long enough to be able to accumulate damage. And this is the sort of list we get. But there is another way that we can convince ourselves that this list is probably complete. And if we go to the next slide, this is why. This has been the same list for nearly 30 years. All of these things have been studied a lot by people who study the biology of aging for, and since the early 1980s, or in many cases a lot longer than that. So, you know, we have come a long way in that time in our ability to analyze biological systems and see what they are made of and what they are doing. We really should have extended this list if there were any extending to do. So I'm very optimistic that this list really is complete. So that's good news. But now for the really good news. Next slide, please. We have a good idea how to fix each of these things. On the left-hand side of this table is the same list that we had on the previous slide. It's in slightly different words, but it's the same list. On the right-hand side, we have all the ways in which we can fix these things. And, of course, I am just describing those, those fixes in a few words for each one on this table. But the good news is that, in fact, we can describe these things in a lot of detail. The book that I wrote a few years ago, Ending Aging, which is being translated into French at the moment, uh, well, uh, well, if you get it, 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 that each of these seven types of damage has a whole chapter about it in the book. A whole chapter describing the details of the therapies that we are going to develop that will repair this damage. In some cases, we are already quite close. So if we consider cell loss, having too few cells, the repair for that problem is what stem cell therapy is for. 
We put new cells into the body to replace the cells that the body is not creating on its own. There are also clinical trials in humans, not just in the laboratory, to get rid of molecular garbage, molecular junk between cells. Many of the other uh, um, types of damage that we see here are harder to fix and the strategies for fixing them are still at a much earlier stage. And those are the areas in which Sense Foundation focuses its efforts. But I think that we have a good chance of developing these technologies within the next 25 years, so long as the research that we are doing at the moment receives enough funding so that it does not go too slowly. I think we have a good chance of developing a proof of concept of these therapies in the laboratory within less than 10 years. That will be to apply these therapies to mice. And I think we can do that quite soon. So this is pretty good news, and this is what Sense Foundation does. Next slide, please. However, this will not be a complete cure for aging. I think that when we develop these therapies, we will probably be able to postpone the ill health, the sickness of old age, by about 30 years. And that's a lot compared to what we can do at the moment. So that will be pretty good. But it is not a real complete cure for aging. So, as you know, I think that we can probably postpone aging indefinitely for people who are already alive. So, what is the next step? Well, first of all, let us think why it should be only 30 years. It's because we are applying these therapies to people who are already in middle age, already maybe 60 or 70 years old at the time that the therapies are developed. That has a very important side effect. Next slide, please. There is a third reason why the maintenance approach is so promising. I have told you that it's good because it seems to target the weak link between metabolism and pathology. And it's also good because that weak link is simpler than metabolism or pathology. But the third really important reason why the maintenance approach is so promising is that when we repair damage, we buy time. If you take someone who is 60 years old and you apply these therapies to them, you rejuvenate that person so that they will not be biologically 60 again until they are chronologically 90, then you have those 30 years in which to figure out what to do next. And that, very useful. Next slide, please. On this graph, I'm going to try to explain why it is so useful to have therapies that can be applied to people who are already in middle age. On the x-axis, we have age, and on the y-axis, we have reserve. Now, reserve is simply the opposite of damage. Reserve can be thought of as the amount of additional damage that you can afford to accumulate over what you already have before pathology starts to happen. So, the red line describes normal aging. At age zero, you have not very much damage, lots of reserve, and time goes by, aging happens, your damage goes up, your reserve goes down, and eventually you reach that horizontal dotted line called the frailty threshold, where pathology starts to happen, and then you are sick for a while and then you die. Now the pink line it describes what I have told you so far. We are going to be able to take people who are in middle age, so they are not sick yet, but they are quite close to being sick, and we will be able to repair a lot of the damage that they have accumulated. And after we have done that repair, they will continue to accumulate damage at the normal rate, because we have not interfered with the creation of damage, 
but we can apply the therapy again, a second time, and a third time, and so on. So we can extend the life of the person who is receiving the therapies. However, as you can see, it doesn't work forever, because each time that we apply the therapy, the therapy works less well than it did the previous time. That's because there is all this other damage, the difficult damage, that we are not succeeding in repairing, because the therapies do not work on it. And eventually that difficult damage, on its own, will be enough to cause pathology, even if we are fixing the easy damage really frequently and really thoroughly. So that's why I think that these first therapies that we should probably be able to develop in the next 25 years will only give us maybe 30 years of extra life. However, let's now talk about buying time. The interval, the time between the first application of these therapies, the first time that this person receives these therapies and the second time they receive them, will be probably 15 or 20 years. In that time, we will be able to improve the therapies. We will be able to make them cheaper and easier, maybe, but also we will be able to make them more comprehensive. So the second time that this person receives these therapies, they will not be the same therapies. They will still be able to fix the easy damage but they will also be able to fix some of the hard damage, some of the difficult damage. And that means that the person will be rejuvenated more thoroughly than they were the first time, even though with the old therapies they would be rejuvenated less thoroughly. So that's what we are seeing on the brown line, the orange line. The Rejuvenation process does not need to have this problem of diminishing returns just so long as we can improve the comprehensiveness of the therapies rapidly enough to keep one step ahead of the problem. Okay, so that is a really important concept. The minimum speed at which we need to improve the comprehensiveness of the therapies in order to have the trend, the long-term trend of this line be upwards rather than downwards so that someone can avoid the frailty, the ill health of old age however long they live. I have given a name to that speed, that minimum speed at which things have to be improved. I call it longevity escape velocity. Next slide please. So this is longevity escape velocity written out in words and it seems very complicated but as you can see it's a very simple concept really the rate at which these rejuvenation therapies that repair the damage of aging need to be improved following the first generation therapies that I think we can develop within the next 25 years <coughs> rate of they need to be improved in order to stay one step ahead of the damage that they cannot yet repair. Next slide, please. Now, the question is, of course, is longevity escape velocity realistic? Is it likely that we will be able to improve the therapies that quickly? Well, I think it's very likely indeed. In fact, I think it's virtually certain. And I'm going to tell you why in two ways. First of all, we can look at other technologies, technologies from the past, and we can say, well, okay, how rapidly were they developed? Now, it's very difficult indeed to predict how quickly a major technological advance will occur. Leonardo da Vinci probably thought that he was only 20 years away from building a, an airplane, but he was wrong. But the brothers did it eventually. And after that, everything was different. We, were not, we did not need to make any fundamental breakthroughs. We only needed to make incremental, small refinements, small improvements, one, on, one after the other. And progress since then was really rapid. So I bet that the Wright brothers were very surprised when it only took 24 years 
before someone could fly on their own across the Atlantic. But of course that is Charles Lindbergh landing at Le Bourget in 1927. After that, it was only 22 years before the first commercial jetliner, and then only 20 years before the first supersonic airliner. So if we ask about aging, we can say, well, yes, probably there is a 50% chance that we will develop these first therapies in the next 25 years. But we may be wrong. If we are unlucky, if we find some new problems, it could take 100 years. However, once we do it, once we have developed those first therapies, the hard part is done. And after that, we can just improve them by small amounts added together. And that's all we need to do to achieve longevity escape velocity. So if we think about it, that is really fast compared to how rapidly we would need to develop these therapies. Now, a more direct um, analysis of whether we will be able to achieve longevity escape velocity would be to do a computer simulation. So a few years ago, I did one. Next slide, please. I took the definition of metabolism, that, of aging, that I showed you earlier, and we wrote a computer simulation that worked on exactly that, so that we could look at the impact of interventions against aging. And this is published, so I will only talk about it in a little, in a small amount, but on the next slide, please, next slide, uh, we can see the, the main result. The black line on the left is what's called a survival curve. It is a graph of showing how many of an initial population are alive at any given age. And it is a simple plot of, I think it was, Americans in 1999. So everybody is alive at age zero, of course, and hardly anybody dies until age 50 or 60. And then people die very rapidly, and hardly anyone lives beyond 100. So, what happens if we apply these therapies? Well. The dark blue line that is right next to the black line, that's what happens if we apply these therapies, but we only start them at the age of 80. So, of course, the blue line and the black line are on top of each other until about halfway down, because about half of the population are already dead by the age of 80. But after that, there is some benefit. Some people live a bit longer, but only a little bit longer. And this brings me back to the thing that I said at the beginning of the talk. This, this work is all about health. If people are unhealthy, they are not going to carry on living. They will get sick and they will die if they are unhealthy. So the only way that we can keep people alive for a long time is by stopping them from being unhealthy, by keeping them in the same state of health as young adults. So, we didn't do it with the 80-year-olds. People who are 80, a few of them get maybe 20 years of additional life, but no more than that. But now let's look at the next line, the sky blue line that is near to the dark blue line. In this line, in this simulation, people get the same therapies, but they get them starting at the age of 70. And in this case, uh, it, at first, it's the same story. People are continuing to die because they are still unwell. But eventually, the therapies start to win. They start to get the upper hand. And the people who are lucky enough to live to 120 or 130, they start to become biologically younger again, so that the likelihood of dying in the next year starts to go down. And eventually, about 10% of that population just get to a point where they are just like young adults and they have no risk of dying from old age whatsoever, none at all. If we now see the brown line, that's the same thing for people who were given these therapies starting at the age of 60. And as you can see, nearly half of them survive long enough 
to avoid aging altogether. So this is longevity escape velocity, all right. But the really good news is what I have said above the graph. In this simulation, I was extremely pessimistic about the rate of progress. I proposed that we would only double the power of these therapies every 42 years. Now, remember that 42 years is the time between Charles Lindbergh flying across the Atlantic and Concorde flying across the Atlantic. So, really, it's completely crazy to suggest that we would go that slowly, that we would take that long to double the power of these therapies. But even if we did, even if we were incredibly slow, we would still have longevity escape velocity. So this concept that we can keep one step ahead of the problem, it's rather counterintuitive, it surprises a lot of people, and it scares a lot of people. But the fact is, it's going to happen. If we can get these first initial therapies that give us maybe 30 years of extra life, starting from middle age, then we will have done the hard part and we will have done most of the work that is required to defeat aging altogether. So on the next slide, we can see what this means for longevity. I expect that most of you know that the world record for longevity is held by a French woman, Jeanne Calment, who died in 1997 at the age of 122. And that means that it is very unlikely that anyone will live to 150 unless we develop these first therapies that I have spoken about today. But because of longevity escape velocity, once we have done that, people who are only a little bit younger will probably be able to avoid aging forever. And that means that they will live a lot longer. A thousand years is roughly how long we would live today if we did not have aging, if the only things that killed us were the things that kill young adults today. So that number is not just made up, it's a real number. In fact, it is probably quite conservative, quite pessimistic. This scares people. People don't like to hear that we are this close to completely curing aging but it seems to be true. So, in finishing my talk, I just want, on the next slide, next slide, to tell you about my, about my book. Yep, next slide. Forward, that's it. Um, this book was written a few years ago, but it is still quite up to date. If you speak English, then please buy it and read it. And, as I said, it is being translated into French. It tells all the details about the therapy that we are developing that will reach longevity escape velocity and about the problems that they will be addressing. Also, of course, you can contact us online, on the web, or by email. So that is all I would like to say, and I would like to thank you for listening to me. And again, I apologize that I had to speak in English. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, I should emphasize that even for those two therapies, 
there are many different variations on them that need to be done for different tissues. So, for example, if we talk about the junk outside cells and the immunotherapy that is being done, then there are clinical trials in humans for one particular type of junk, the, the type that accumulates in the brain during Alzheimer's disease, but there are similar types of junk which accumulate in other places in the body, and we are still not doing clinical trials on those. Those are still being developed in the laboratory. Secondly, it's important to remember that we need to make some good progress on all seven of these therapies in order to get any real benefit for longevity, because any of these seven types of damage can kill us on its own, even if we completely eliminate the other six. So we are still a long way from really making this work. In the laboratory, some of these therapies are not even working in mice yet. We are just doing experiments with cells in dishes and in test tubes. So we, still, we are still at an early stage, I'm afraid. But the important thing is we do know where we are going. We have a detailed plan. And we, we, it's just really putting in hard work to get from the test tube into the mice and then into humans. Hi. Hi. I want, I want, you told that science needs uh, to go uh, faster and uh, if we had money, of course, we will go faster. Would you like, please, uh, to mention how we can, by the uh, use of uh, the art and exposition, uh, make in a sort that we can uh, collect more funds to research and that is why I ask you to speak of this uh, in the name of Bernardo, but maybe you woke yeah. up uh, too early to remind me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, no, no, I was relying on you, Ingrid. What? Sorry? I was relying on you to remind me. Anyway, so, um, yes, I think that Ingrid makes a very important point here. The science of the biology of aging is very complicated and many people do not really want to think about it. Many powerful people are scared by thinking about science in general and especially about this area of science. So there needs to be a wide variety of different approaches to getting people interested enough to support this work financially. One of the most important ways is to bring other aspects of culture into the, uh, into the conversation, especially art. So, um, Natasha Vita Moore, who is in the audience, has for a long time been almost the only person in the whole uh, transhumanist and visionary techn technological world who has been talking about the role of art in technology. But now, thanks to Ingrid and one or two other people, uh, such as Rachel Armstrong in London, for example, we have a lot more interest in that. And Ingrid in particular has founded an organization, CEA, the, Council, the European Council for the Arts, which is designed to bring art and technology together especially focused on long-term, ambitious, visionary technology. CELA is based in Paris, of course, but, we, but Ingrid has brought me and a few other people into that organization. So we try to be active in other countries too, and especially in Italy. There is a lot going on right now. So, the, in the name of Leonardo is a project of CELA which has been spearheaded by Ingrid. And Ingrid, I would like you to say a few more words to describe what will happen, what is ha going to happen soon in the name of Leonardo. So, if somebody could give her back the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, just one. Um, 
Personal uh, relation with uh, all this question, and do you believe that you will stay alive more than 150 years? <laughs> and do you prepare yourself to uh, die uh, one day or another? <laughs> uh, I've thought really very much about how long I am going to live. The main thing that drives my interest in working in this area is the humanitarian impact. This is the way I think about it. These technologies will happen anyway, whether or not I spend my time trying to develop them. So the only question is, how soon will they be developed? And maybe I am making a difference of a few years to that time scale. No more than 10 years, though. So if I think about the difference that I am making to my own chances of benefiting from these technologies, then it's not very big, maybe 10% at most. It's not very easy to get excited about that. But if I think about the world in general, then I realize that even if I bring forward the defeat of aging by one day, I will be saving 100,000 lives. It's very easy to get excited about that. Yeah, so that's I, what drives me. I know, that was just a personal question. And uh, are you afraid about death? And what is your relation with that? Or? was more a personal <laughs> question because you are, uh, you are you you work uh, on the theoretic level and so I wanted just to have your personal uh, emotional uh, <laughs> yeah idea about I, I, the question. I wouldn't say I'm exactly afraid of death but I certainly look both ways when I cross the street you know I I do not do risky things <laughs> <laughs> another question we have a, a few time for a while 
Um, so, uh, if we have not other question uh, for the for the wire operator, we have to thank you uh, very very much uh, to uh, to uh, wake up early and uh, uh, to be with us uh, this morning for for you. I hope uh, that uh, we will have uh, other occasions uh, uh, to to find you in Paris uh, for next time and. Uh, for our part, uh, we are continuing uh, the conference, and uh, we have to say you goodbye. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. That was my